This is the Teeth to Toes podcast. Now, I'm Dr. Curtis Westerson, and I treat TMJ issues. And I have a really special co-host with me today, a Kara Shulton, who I get to work with um, on a regular basis over the phone because I send my patients to see her husband. And he is the other special guest we have today, <laughs> a Dr. Jeff Schulten. I take it you two guys know each other, is that right? I feel like I saw him just this morning, actually. Ah, yeah. ah, husband and wife, yes. <laughs> and um, we have a specific question that we want to talk with Jeff about. Now, we all know that every single patient that comes to the dentist always comes with their head connected to their neck, connected to their torso, with some assortment of limbs, right? I, I've never seen a patient come in just with their head um, in a bucket or a box, like um, Purilator doesn't deliver me this, oh, Mrs. Jones, how you doing? Very nice to see you. That never happens. <laughs> I have a, a, another rule in my office, um, uh, Kira, I'm not sure if you know about this rule that my office has, but um, nobody is allowed to be a patient unless they're a breather. We only take breathing patients, no non-breathing patients. It's an excellent policy to have, Curtis. Yes, do you know why we don't take non-breathing patients? No. Because if you don't breathe, you are? Dead. Dead, yeah, and dead people don't have credit. They can't pay for their appointment. <laughs> at the end of the appointment, and I've got a business to run. But anyway, that's not the point. The point is, everybody comes to my office as a functional human being, breathing, all connected, um, but maybe some issues with the way they're all connected. And that's why I've been working with Dr. Jeff Schulten for over two decades now. And Jeff has taught me so much about the head and neck and the workings of the body, he's made me a better dentist by far. And so Jeff, welcome to the Teeth to Toes podcast. How are you today? I'm doing wonderfully. Thanks for having me. You're very welcome. Um, now, one of the things that we're gonna talk about today is does the neck cause TMJ problems that I get to deal with or does TMJ cause neck problems that you get to deal with? Which comes first? Um, I guess that, Kira, that might be the chicken or the egg type thing. Which <laughs> one comes first? Right. Hmm. Are you goading hmm. me to an answer there, Curtis? Oh, uh, well, what would you room, say? I think it was the rooster. The rooster comes first. Smart idea. I think it's kind of happening all at the same time, and, and yeah, maybe it's something else. Um, so, Jeff, if I'm talking to you, and I see that a patient has some uh, uh, neck issues, and I refer that patient to you to be assessed, how, number one, how do you assess that? And then how do you assess also the patients that you see that aren't coming from me, how do you assess if they have a bite problem or they don't have a bite problem? Can you explain that? Yeah, well, the great thing, having worked together for the last couple of decades, is, is my education has also improved in terms of how the head and neck uh, are influenced by the bite. And so our initial assessment when we see a patient is about determining candidacy for care. So. You mentioned that nobody comes in with a head without a body, and uh, for us, we also don't accept patients who aren't breathing, but the typical patient that we see also has two legs, and we think it's really great for a human being who lives in gravity and has two legs, if they want to, to be able to stand on those two legs evenly. So that's the essence of the beginning of our assessment, and so we'll start 
by seeing how a person walks and moves. And, you know, when you walk and move, you should walk a certain way and, and, and you should hit your feet fairly evenly. And there's certain characteristics that we're looking for. And then we, then we go and look at how you're standing and, and do you have hips that are on level, shoulders that are tilted, head that's tilted? Are you standing on one leg more than the other? Are you standing too far forward, standing too far backwards? Um, you know, is your head too far in front of your shoulders or are your shoulders too far behind your hips? All of these things we're looking for. And then if we see that there appears to be some postural asymmetry, which is I think what I've taught you to look for over the course of our time together, usually when you're sending somebody, they're pre-screened by you. You've, you've seen that they do have this and so we're confirming what you've found and, uh, and putting some measurements to it. And then we're looking at the feet because the feet can influence the body. If you have a uh, arch that's dropped or pronated or, or if you have some twisting, like one foot might twist out more than the other foot. So we wanna understand that. We, we look at the eyes to see if you see level as level because not everybody does. So not everybody should be the chief picture hanger in their household. <laughs> but uh, we want you to be able to see level as level and use both eyes. And then we look at the bite, you know, so we'll have people just swallow just a little bit of, uh, of their own spit, just swallow it and see if their head, if their chin thrusts. There's quite a number of people who every time they swallow, their chin will thrust a little bit and they're basically whiplashing their neck every time they swallow. How many times do people swallow a day, Curtis? Um, well, they swallow several times an hour and uh, that's day and night. Yeah. So thousands of times a day they're swallowing and so if they're whiplashing their neck, then that, that swallow um, dysfunction isn't really good for the neck. So I look at that and then I check their midline. I see how their mouth opens and closes. I check if there's any grinding or clicking in their jaw joint. And, and then a lot of the time when the TMJ joint gets inflamed, it pushes into the ear and you taught me this to sort of check in the ear to see if the TMJ joint, so the joint itself, the disc that's in the joint, um, is taking up space in the ear canal as an inflamed. So we look for that. And then we try to look and see if their uh, teeth are hitting equally. And we see if they have all their teeth. First of all, that's important. But if they do, then do they hit equally when they tap their teeth together? And if they don't, we try to understand whether that might be being caused by a head being crooked or contributing to a head being crooked. So ascending versus descending issues. If the posture is bothering the bite, then we call it an ascending issue. And if the bite is bothering the posture, we call it a descending issue. So that's basically what I take them through in their initial assessment. So, so let me get this right. So sometimes the bite is creating a head neck issue and sometimes the head neck misalignments causing a bite issue. Is that kind of correct? Yeah, well, I mean, when you go back to the initial cause, I think, obviously, it's always the neck, Curtis. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> right? But, yeah. Yeah. you know, down the road, as all the dysfunction set in, I'm sure, that I, I, you know, you and I have worked on this for a long time. I have a really hard time separating the head and neck from the bite in terms of function. They, they influence each other uh, in, in everything that they're doing. And so I think that the bite is influencing the neck and the neck is influencing the bite. And to fix either one, you have to make sure both are reasonably functional and the body can cope with any smaller levels of dysfunction that are residual. Now, now I think Kira, you actually remember helping Jeff and I and uh, another doctor from the University of Calgary, a Dr. Ray Turner, um, actually have a study about yes. how the bite alignment affects the, the way the teeth touch and how that changes when the bite is adjusted. And thanks to Kira for actually making that study possible because she took the scratchings of a bunch of three guys and made them actually into English. Is that yes. correct, Kira? Yes, I, I do enjoy doing that. I'd like changing chicken scratches into legible writing. It's 
It's part of, it's part of my game. But that bringing that up reminds me because I I don't I don't know if this was from that paper, but I know Jeff, you talked, you told me about that study one time about teeth, or maybe it was Curtis about the the mice with the scoliosis and the teeth and how. Um, adding a tiny bit onto a molar caused scoliosis and then removing it made the scoliosis go away. Can you remind us about that study? That I thought that was really interesting and it's undeniable, uh, the correlation when you hear about a study like that. Well, it, I think it was, wasn't mice, it was a rat. And they added oh, resin rat, okay. to one side. <laughs> uh, mouse, rat. I mean, they're all friendly, similar animals. But they added resin to one side. Uh, they had a rat that was straight. Wasn't that correct, Jeff? They had a rat that was straight with his head, neck, and spine. They added a little bit of resin, and the rat suddenly had a scoliosis. They took the resin away, and then the rat straightened out. Wasn't that the study? Yeah, that's the study I'm thinking about. I mean, that it's, it's so tangible when you hear something like that, that something like your bite being off and... and and a problem with one tooth being too high or something could c cause a whole host of other problems that the average person, I think, wouldn't consider that being an issue, that just the fact that your tooth is hitting a little bit strangely, you wouldn't think about the host of problems that that could cause. Now, Jeff, you, well, you I don't think you treat too many rats, but you do treat a lot of patients that have maybe the bite influencing. What can you say about that? Well. I think all of our audience might not know this, but we're in Calgary, Alberta, and Calgary, Alberta is a rat-free province. province. So, yeah, we don't have any rats here. <laughs> good, but, good point. Um, yeah, these were, to my memory, these were Italian researchers, and, and this study was uh, a really interesting study. And, of course, animal studies are, are not the same as human studies, but you can't do everything to humans that animals will, unfortunately, volunteer for. And so the... Well, we, what was found when they when the looked at the discussion from the authors is what they thought was that when the resin was put underneath the, the, uh, on the first molar on one side, it tilted the head, which therefore tilted the first vertebra and caused compensatory tilts and twists all the way, way down the spine of the, of the rat. And then when they balanced it out on the other side, those, those compensations reduced and, and it went back towards normal. And so it was a really profound study for exactly what we're talking about here. And in that situation, that would be called a descending influence with a bite and some imbalance in the bite, like a high filling. You would know more about that, Curtis, because that's more what would be happening if somebody in your profession wasn't doing their job right, maybe. Um, or if somebody ended up with a neck injury that caused their head to become imbalanced and their, and their jaw shifted, and then the previous OK bite started to create a dysfunction and create a problem. And they might you know, not even know that. You might have had a whiplash injury and nobody's really looked at your bite because everybody's concentrating on your neck or back and nobody's concentrating on the, on the imbalance that was created in your bite from that neck or back injury. So yeah, I think it goes both directions again. So Jeff, a lot of dentists, myself included, um, we'll do our little dental work on a tooth and we'll sit the patient up and say, how does that feel? How's that feel? And the patient's going, uh, feels, I think it feels a little high. And we'll, we say, well, just let the freezing come out, come on back in. And then within a week, that filling no longer feels high. And I'm always wondering, you know, if you put a crown on that initially felt high and then a couple of weeks later felt okay, that crown's really, really hard. It's hard to grind it off, yet suddenly it doesn't feel high anymore. What's happening with that from your perspective? Curtis, when you say high, what, what do you mean by high? What does the what does the person sitting in the dentist chair um, oh, take? Is that like fast times at Richmond High? <laughs> no, you're not. Or I mean, so, it's legal in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> You're not, not getting high, but it actually feels like it's the first tooth that touches and they're sitting up in the chair after you've done all this work and they're kind of numb on one side and they go like, uh, Like you feel like you've yeah, got a strawberry I, seed stuck in your molar. 100%. That's exactly right. You feel okay. like you got that strawberry seed. So a week later... The strawberry seed, though it was never a strawberry seed, but it, it feels like that strawberry seed 
has gone away. And I'm going, how did that happen? You can't grind it down. What In a week, what happened? And it's because the body compensated? Is that kind of the idea is that there's a head and neck compensation? Yeah, well, I think that um, I think that what Kira's saying is exactly right. I think, you know, there's a couple of different pieces, and that is that as human beings, we're able to cope with a lot. We can cope until we can't cope, right? And that, that, is, that is in all aspects of our lives, I think. And so this would be an example of maybe something that was done in a dental chair that wasn't done as precisely as that, as that patient uh, needed at that moment, but the patient had a capacity to adapt around that, and so maybe there's some dysfunction in the, in the joint itself now. Maybe there's uh, dysfunction in the head and neck that, are, that have all shifted slightly to, uh, to cope with what you're calling that high or premature contact or, or uh, strawberry seed feeling on the, on the tooth. And so now the patient has, has been left with uh, other issues that they're coping with. And so you can cope with a lot, and we continue to try to cope with things and, until we can't anymore. And at that point, sometimes you have to deal with all of the pieces as you start to remove things, dysfunctions, uh, malalignments. And if you don't remove the other ones at the same time, then you're making the patient once again, cope with something. And if they don't have the ability because they've just been injured and in, in, in some reason, or maybe this has just been happening long enough, you know, a pebble in a, in a shoe uh, doesn't bother you, maybe when you're walking to your car from your office, but if you're out for a five kilometer or mile stroll, that might end up causing uh, quite a discomfort. And so we can cope with it. Time is a major variable there. And we can cope with it for a while, but. But down the road, you have to maybe put all the pieces of the puzzle back in place to get your body reset and uh, not needing to cope with things so it can heal. Curtis, uh, Curtis, how do you, um, if you have a, a patient that you feel the neck could be causing an issue that's contributing to their problem, how do you tell them about that or, or, or sort of educate them and encourage them to go and get that dealt with so that you can do what you need to do? Good, good question. Good question, Kira. Um, one of the most valuable tools we have is called a comb beam CAT scan uh, or CBCT. And that x-ray shows the human, the <laughs> rented lips, <laughs> the human skull and the spine. And it shows whether or not it's all in alignment. So we've got this skull and we got these neck vertebrae, the um, cervical vertebrae, right, Kira? the yep. cervical vertebrae coming down. And if we see that the skulls here and the vertebrae are this way or this way or this way, then we know that there's some type of misalignment. And do you show that image, um, do you show that image to the patient and they, they can see that or do you just, do you just know that? No, we, we like to show that to the patient so the patient gets yeah. an idea because I don't treat necks. Um, I use somebody like your husband to, to treat mm -hmm. necks because I'm only the dentist. And so he, I say, look at, because everything is twisted or there's torsion or torque, you need to have that assessed by somebody that deals with this alignment all the time. And that's, I only deal with teeth. I don't get to deal with that. So, and so the does CBCT, that kind of explain? Yeah, so the CBCT is the is that that X-ray that goes like a circle around your head when you go to the dentist. And so, do you do that on on all the most all or most patients that are dealing with sort of something significant? So then you have that information. So that's a good question as well. The the comb beam CAT scan CBCT does go all the way around. Now there's another type of X-ray that dentists may get that goes all the way around. And that's called a panorex. And that just shows okay. uh, it's a two dimensional, <coughs> excuse me, if you jumped off of a high tower and you landed face first onto the pavement, your head would be all spread apart. That's, that's, that's what a panorex. Yeah. That's not a panorex. It's like a panorama like. photo, I think. It's a, it's a yeah, less yeah, gross kind of description. A yeah, okay. <laughs> flattened picture. 
Um, whereas the comb you can cast again is in three dimensions, so it lets okay. me kind of spin the head around and look at those neck vertebrae. But I got to cool. tell you, my ability to read that x-ray with the neck vertebrae um, has been greatly enhanced by the education that your husband's given me over the last couple of decades because we now can take a look at all these things like a uh, sort of like a radiologist would look at the neck. Um, Jeff, I want to say one thing that you were talking about that you're looking at, you know, which is which, the neck, the ascending or the bite, the descending. Um, one of the terms I say to my patients is that things may seem insignificant, but insignificant things kind of add up to become significant. And the patients need to treat them at that point. Is that kind of what you're talking about as far as when they need to seek treatment? Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a really interesting issue that patients have, and we all have, I think, is that we tend to respond when things become significant enough for us that it requires a response. And so a lot of patients, you know, they, they might know they have a problem with their neck, they might think they have a problem with their neck, they might think they have a problem with their jaw, but they, it doesn't become a priority for them until it really gets in their way. You know, I think a lot of people who come to us have people who have gotten to the point where they can't cope anymore, and so these things are affecting their ability to sleep, their social life, their ability to interact, their ability to chew things, um, you know, sit at their desk, and, and so it becomes a real issue. And so one of the problems that we have is that as practitioners, they could come to me and say, I have this problem, and I can start adjusting them, and hopefully the problem gets better. If the problem gets a little bit better and, and now they're able to cope again, they, they might not recognize that there's something else that needs to be done here mm -hmm. to take them the rest of the way so that they don't end up in a problem in the future. And we kind of forgive patients for that because they're the ones who are paying us and you know we understand that that, that money has to come out of their pocket and, and, and they have to pay for the service. But where it goes wrong, Curtis, is when it's the practitioner that's the problem. And so this is where we talked a little bit about that last time, where the practitioner is encouraging a patient not to seek treatment in another office. And I've had that conversation with chiropractors many times. They have somebody who comes in, they have a jaw issue. Um, we deal with the neck, so half of it. So we're dealing with the head and neck. And, and so they're like, well, the patient's symptoms went away, so I encouraged them not to go ahead with that dental treatment. And, uh, and, I, and I find that to be a, a real problem when a chiropractor is telling somebody what they should do relative to their dental treatment, I think that they should defer to the dentist for that. And vice versa, when a dentist, you know, they're gonna make a huge change in the bite and maybe somebody's neck feels a little bit better and maybe they've been able to help them, but maybe they haven't really reduced the neck issue to, to the point that it's, it's functioning appropriately and that patient might have long-term issues uh, down the road. So. I would encourage our listeners that are healthcare practitioners, and I'd encourage our patients uh, that are listening, you know, to really, to really uh, investigate and understand what's left. You don't have to necessarily engage treatment, but just investigate with the different practitioners what's left in these different areas, so that you really know the decision you're making if you're going to get involved with uh, treatment right. or if you're going to let it let it be. Right. I had a. Go ahead. A, a, a patient who I've taken care of for 20 years who really never went on to do any of the recommendations that I had made outside. She came in when things were terrible. I would treat her a few times and things would be better. And that went on for about 20 years until they weren't getting better anymore. And then she kept doing things and trying to do things and eventually she needed surgery. But what she said to me, she said, Dr. Schultz, if I knew 20 years ago what I know from experience now, I would have made some different decisions. And it's the challenge. We're really making our decisions today for our future selves. And so just trying to make sure that we really understand the implications of those uh, decisions. And I think that's what drives us all. We see these patients who are suffering needlessly without the knowledge of a potential solution. And, uh, and there are solutions out there 
And healthcare practitioners, chiropractors, dentists specifically in this conversation need to work together for the best uh, outcomes for their patients. So to sum it up, the neck may cause TMJ, the TMJ and the bite, the TMJ and the bite may cause neck issues. Probably it's a little bit of both happening at the same time. And the big takeaway is that there's no one healthcare provider that can treat it all. That you have to work in collaboration or as you and I do in integration to be able to get the maximum amount of healing for patients. Is that kind of a sum it up statement? That's exactly right. Well, you know what? I wanna say thank you very much. This has been a Teeth to Toes podcast and I've had the great opportunity of having a co-host, Kira Shulton, and her husband, Dr. Jeff Shulton, as my guest today. And stay tuned to the Teeth to Toes for more guests about more subjects about TMJ. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.